Domach was studying the potential medical applications of some new chemical dyes. Working with a newly synthesized chemical dye called Prontosil, Domach injected it into some lab mice that were infected with Streptococci bacteria. The dye attached to the bacteria just as Domach had hoped, but the bacteria survived. The dye, it seemed, wasn't toxic enough. Then something startling happened. While the dye didn't kill the bacteria, it did inhibit their growth. The spread of the infection was stopped. The mice recovered. It's not clear when Domach first used Prontosil on a human patient, but the new drug achieved fame when it saved the life of a boy seriously infected with streptococci. The patient's name, Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr son of the President of the United States. From that moment on, Domach's discovery was a sensation. Because Prontosil contained what was known as a sulfanilamide molecular structure, it was called a sulfa drug, the first of its kind. A synthetic chemical substance that could cure and prevent bacterial infection. Domach had opened the door to a revolutionary new approach in the treatment of disease, the use of chemotherapeutic drugs, a discovery that would go on to save tens of thousands of lives. Our next great discovery helped save the lives of millions worldwide who were afflicted with diabetes. Diabetes is a disease that disrupts the body's mechanism for processing sugar, which can lead to blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, even death. For centuries, physicians studied diabetes, searching in vain for a cure. Finally, in the late 1800s, a breakthrough occurred. It was discovered that the bodies of diabetics had something in common. A group of cells in the pancreas was always damaged. These cells produced a hormone that controlled blood sugar. That hormone was called insulin. Then in 1920, another breakthrough. Canadian surgeon Frederick Banting and a graduate student named Charles Best were studying how insulin was produced in the pancreases of dogs. On a hunch, Banting took an extract from the insulin-producing cells of healthy dogs and injected the extract into other dogs already afflicted with diabetes. The results were astounding. Within a few hours, the blood sugar levels of the diabetic dogs decreased significantly. Now Banting and his team set their sights on finding an animal whose insulin bore a close resemblance to human insulin. They found a close match in the insulin taken from cow fetuses, purified it for safe treatment, then in January 1922, conducted the first clinical trial. Banting administered the insulin to a 14-year-old boy dying of diabetes. And the boy made a dramatic recovery. How important was Banting's discovery? Why not ask the estimated 13 million Americans who rely on insulin to control their diabetes every day? Cancer, the second leading cause of death in the United States. Intensive research into its origins and development has spawned remarkable scientific breakthroughs, perhaps none more significant than our next great discovery. To find out about the discovery, I caught up with two Nobel Prize winning cancer researchers, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Varmus and Bishop first joined forces to research cancer in the 1970s. At the time, there were several prevailing theories about the cause of the disease. The malignant cell is complicated. It's not just a, a cell that can replicate indefinitely. It's a cell that can invade, uh, elicit new blood vessels. It has a very complex capability. One theory concerned the Rouse sarcoma virus, 
a virus that caused cancer in chickens. When the virus attacked the cells of a chicken, it inserted its genetic material into the host's DNA. According to the theory, the viral DNA later became a cancer-causing agent. A second theory suggested that once the Rouse sarcoma virus inserted its genetic material into the host cell, the cancer-causing genes didn't activate themselves, but remained dormant until triggered by outside influences, such as harmful chemicals, radiation, or even viral infections. These cancer-causing genes, called oncogenes, became the focus of Varmus and Bishop's research. The fundamental question was, does a human cell, does the human genome, contain genes that either are or are capable of becoming oncogenes of the sort that are in a virus? Tumor-causing genes. Tumor-causing genes, cancer-causing genes, right. Are they in there or not? So what did you discover? First, we started with the chicken, because that's where this virus came from. Is there a gene in chickens? And then later, is there a gene in other birds, in mammals, in humans, related to the cancer gene of the Rouse sarcoma virus? So what we did was to make um, a radioactive molecule that could be used as a probe for asking whether the oncogene of Rouse sarcoma virus resembled a normal gene present in, in the chromosomes of a, of a chicken. And the answer was yes. It was a landmark discovery. Varmus and Bishop found that the cancer-causing gene was already present in the DNA of normal, uninfected chicken cells. Even more remarkable, they found it in human DNA as well, proof that the seeds of cancer may already be inside each of us at the cellular level, just waiting to be activated. How can one of our own genes, which we've, we've had all our lives, cause cancer? When cells divide, mistakes are made. Mm -hmm. They are more frequent if the cell is uh, stressed by... Cosmic ray. Cigarette smoke. Cigarette, Cigarette smoke, smoke. is a good example. It is important also to recognize that when cells divide, they have to copy three billion base pairs of DNA. And anybody who's ever tried to type something knows that it's not easy to do that. We have spell check mechanisms that allow detection of mistakes and repair of those mistakes, but still, things slip through when you're doing things on such a large scale. So why is this a great discovery? That difference between the gene and the virus and the gene in the cell exemplifies the fundamental way people were trying to think about cancer, and we now do think about cancer, that small changes in particular genes in our cells can convert cells from controlled regular growth and other behavior to the behavior of a malignant cell. And this really was the first direct illustration of that sort of thing. Is modern cancer research a result of your discovery? It's a fundamental platform on which almost all um, molecular approaches to cancer is built. And indeed, you know, as someone now who runs a cancer hospital, uh, what's exciting for me at the moment is seeing how an understanding of cancer at the molecular and genetic level is influencing the way in which we treat a lot of our patients. Why is it important? Uh, looking f for this kind of gene is vital in diagnostics now. It's vital in, in prediction of how cancers are going to behave. And above all else, it's vital because it's provided these targets for truly specific therapy that we simply didn't have before. The city of Chicago population about three million. The same number of people who are dying each year from AIDS, one of the worst epidemics in modern history. The first clues about the disease emerged in the early 1980s. Researchers in the United States reported that a rising number of patients were dying from rare infections and cancers. Blood samples revealed that the patients had extremely low levels of CD4 T lymphocytes, white blood cells vital to the body's immune system. In 1982, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention gave the disease a name, AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Two researchers took up the case, Luc Montagnier at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, and Robert Gallo at the National Cancer Institute outside Washington, D.C. 
Both share credit for the breakthrough discovery that eventually uncovered the cause of AIDS, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. What is different about human immunodeficiency virus from another virus, like, like, like the flu or something? Firstly, uh, the virus doesn't give evidence of disease for years. Let's take an average, seven years? Seven years. Second problem that was rather unique. By the time a person presented themselves with AIDS and said, you know, I'm sick, I'm here to go in the hospital, they had a myriad of other infections. What was the cause? How do you demonstrate which one of these is the cause of the disease? In most cases, a virus exists for one purpose, to infect a host cell and reproduce. Typically, it attaches itself to the host, then releases its genetic information into the cell. This enables the virus to take over the cell's normal functions, redirecting them to produce new virus particles. These particles are then released to attack more cells. HIV is not a conventional virus. It, it belongs to the family of viruses or the category of viruses that scientists call retroviruses. How are retroviruses different? Just like the virus classes that include polio or virus classes that include influenza, retroviruses are another type of virus. Mm -hmm. What's unique about a retrovirus is that, and what we might say is the sine qua non of a definition of a retrovirus, is its genetic information in the form of RNA is converted into DNA. But it's what happens to DNA that gives us our problem. The and what is that? The DNA gets incorporated into our genes. The DNA of the virus becomes part of us. As the T helper cells reproduce, they're reproducing with the virus, the, exactly. the retrovirus DNA in exactly. them. Exactly, exactly. Forever. Forever. You never get over it. You'll have cells harboring the genetic information for the virus, sometimes making virus, others silent, quiet, perhaps hidden, but only later to pop out and reproduce virus again. That means very rapidly, upon infection, we're establishing a, an infection that's likely to be lifelong. So that's what, that's the crux of the issue for me. A cure for HIV remains elusive, but the discovery that HIV is a retrovirus and that HIV causes AIDS has led to breakthroughs in the fight against the disease and beyond. What has changed in medicine since the discovery of retroviruses or more specifically the discovery of this virus? AIDS has been the lead ship in showing that antiviral drug therapy is possible. In general, it was thought, because viruses usurp the cell, our cells, for how they reproduce themselves, it would be nearly impossible to target them effectively without poisoning a person badly. You're saying that nobody was investing in, if I may, antivirotics? AIDS has opened the door to antiviral research in the pharmaceutical companies and in universities broadly across the world. AIDS has also had positive spin-offs sociologically. I witnessed firsthand a difference between developing and developed nations. You can't just drop the drugs on the beach and run home. Mm -hmm. It requires training on how to use the drugs, and we have that relationship with several African countries now. So this is an irony, that this horrible Sorry. disease is actually bringing people together. I think so. Thanks to the discoveries that we've just seen, the world has changed. From germ theory to uncovering the origins of cancer, these breakthroughs have altered the course of history, saving countless lives and pushing the boundaries of our medical knowledge to where we are today. Ready for the next breakthrough?